Hi everyone, my name is Rita Fadel and I'm the Music Librarian for Fort Worth Public Library. And today I have a quick Q&A with one of our amazing Amplify 817 curators, John David Bartlett. Hi, John David. Hi, hi, hi. Zoom. Yeah, it's on Zoom, on Zoom. Even though I would love to do this in person, we're doing this on Zoom. Um, so would you like to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about you, your projects, and just tell everybody who you are who might not know who you are? Well... As you can see, I'm an older guy. I rocked and rolled all my life. I've been a, I've been a musician and I've been recording since I was a, a teenager. I recorded my first uh, record uh, over off of Seventh Street with uh, Mickey Moody in 1966. Me and my girlfriend, we were going to LD Bell at the time. We recorded a song. We were the, he called us the two different, the two different. And we were going to be the new mamas and papas. And it uh, didn't happen. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, I went on and uh, I recorded for um, a record label in Houston called International Art. It's kind of a legendary label, psychedelic rock and roll, 13th Four Elevators, Red Crayola, Golden Dawn, which means, and my album was never released. Maybe more on that in a minute, I'll tell you. But, how that's developed 50 years later. But uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I was signed by uh, 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 A&M Records. Lou Adler signed me at, after that contract with International Artists in Houston went under. And uh, I, I went out to LA and boy, the music business scared me to death. I was just a little boy from Texas. And I took myself back home pretty quick. I got Came home from Sunset Strip. I learned my lesson. Mama said, <laughs> Mama <laughs> told me not to come. Uh, but uh, uh, I came back, and uh, I, my, my education is in, uh, is in theater, uh, theater history, uh, theater direction, and theater management. And so I, uh, I, I've acted and uh, directed and produced uh, shows and uh, my own music for 50 years. But uh, I, I've done it in such a way that it's like, I guess I'm like a painter and I have a big stack of paintings sitting in the, the back room that I finished and I have them chronologically in order and no one's ever seen them. Because it's like Frank Zappa said uh, uh, in an interview with Johnny Carson when he asked him, what can you tell me about the mothers of invention? And uh, Frank Davis said, no commercial potential. And that's kind of the way that uh, uh, I've looked at my art, but it's given me the opportunity to be involved in a lot of things over the years. I've produced a lot of other uh, performers. I've produced a lot of theater. I was uh, associate artistic director and theater manager at the Caravan of Dreams from 84 to 89. Uh, I had a, uh, prior to that, I had a live performance venue in Austin on 6th Street, one of the first live performance venues for rock and roll music. There was a lot of cajunta going on at the time down there on 6th Street. But uh, I took an old uh, uh, porno movie theater that it turned into a gay <laughs> disco and ripped out all the disco stuff and turned it into a rock and roll and punk music place called New Atlantis. And, uh, uh, but then uh, I spent a long time at the Caravan of Dreams and got involved in the production of uh, music, got involved with uh, uh, Ornette Coleman and James Blood Ulmer, Chief Twin 77 from Nigeria and the Black Ghost International, and uh, uh, learned quite a bit about uh, record labels and what they actually do for people and publishing companies and what they do for people. And so I started uh, putting uh, that uh, experience to, to work uh, for myself for a while. 2012, I went out to uh, LA uh, to a friend at William Morris Agency and uh, got to uh, uh, work with Randy Newman's son, Amos Newman, to uh, uh, learn the way that the new uh, uh, music copyright laws were working in the United States that just came into effect in uh, 2009, 2010, and were affecting the music industry greatly. And I uh, took all that production information and, and uh, uh, 
and then the new information I was recording about copyright and royalty collection and kept storing it in that back room where all my music was. And I, uh, I, 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 I had a period of time where I found myself not doing anything. About six or seven years, uh, I was down in Wimberley outside of Austin. And uh, I was thought I was an old retired hippie on the river and I was just getting old. But it turned out that I was kind of sick and I ended up having open heart surgery. And uh, I uh, 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 couldn't believe it. I knew that I had arrhythmia for, for my entire life. But all of a sudden, a uh, cardiologist just said, well, all right, it's time. You're going to go under it. So I have some bionic parts and some bypass things. And, and I woke up from it and I realized that, oh my God, I had not been thinking for like six years or 10 years. I'd just been wasting time and I didn't. And I, but because I, I, all of a sudden blood was going to my head again. <laughs> so I. It gave you like a second. A second birth. Sort of, yeah, like a phoenix was rising from the flames. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this was not too long ago, uh, 2014. And I'm in 2015, actually. And uh, um, uh, anyway, right after that, I, I, I met and started talking to uh, Robbie and Jennifer Rux uh, from Dreamy Life Records. They were uh, big fans of uh, the 13th Four Elevators and international artists, which I told you about, was back there at the beginning. And, uh, uh, and we started talking about, uh, they wanted to hear stories. They were really interested in, in the... And boy, are there a lot of stories. I'd say I've ended up in a, in, in a bunch of books because of that period of time. That uh, two or three years from 68 to 71, uh, 72, I've ended up in like four or five books. One that just came out, uh, Paul Drummond in London, uh, just uh, published a book on Anthology Press called The 13th Four Elevators, 13th Four Elevators A Visual History. And uh, I'm in that book. But I've been even in a bio, biography of, uh, of of Lightning Hopkins. It's amazing. I, I, I'm not in history. But uh, anyway, they wanted to hear all these old stories. So I was talking to them sitting around the library that Dreamy Life used to have over uh, by Arts Fifth Avenue in the Fairmount District. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about it. And every, this is a story that's been repeated a lot about, about me. I'm kind of mysterious and obscure there are there's even magazine articles that called me mysterious and obscure because uh my album was never released on international artist i was waiting for to be ia number 13 and it uh and the label folded after the 12th record if you can believe that and so uh, i can't uh, believe that i can believe that it's, it's hard to run a label and i don't think people realize that but it just sometimes you get really lucky sometimes you're just that one album like yeah one or two albums so it would have been a great album uh and so robbie asked me robbie said uh he's and jennifer was all excited about hearing about that in those times we recorded the last 13th four elevators album at the same time that i was trying to finish up that album just before the label closed. So there was a bunch of uh, info that she wanted to hear. But, and, and she said, why don't we try to do that album right now? Because it's almost exactly 50 years later. And I went, oh, well, I don't know. I said, I started thinking about all my friends who are all as old as me. And I knew that we would get the, you know, start playing the songs and they would be, you know, and I just, uh, and I kept, and I couldn't picture it in my mind. I said, well, I could try to reproduce it. I said, I'll get some friends together. And Robbie said, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. I got some young guys in Denton I want you to meet. And he took, this was like, what, almost, this now was three or four years ago, uh, three years ago. And he, he uh, uh, took me to Denton to meet Acid Carousel, Gus Baldwin, John Kuzmic, and, uh, and, uh, 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 Lucas Magnus and uh, uh, and then and Ian Salazar was playing bass at the time and Fuller Whittington the third was playing drums I can I can claim that I made an album with the original Acid Carousel <laughs> because that was the band that recorded the original tracks that we then spent the last couple of years 
overdubbing on. And basically the album was created by myself and John Kozimek and Gus Baldwin and Lucas. And uh, they're the four of us that are pictured on the album. And we're getting ready to release it this year, probably in November of this year. We're gonna release a single, a bonus single that's not on the album, a song that was written by Donovan called Ricky Tiki Tabby is three time. We're gonna release that in a couple of weeks. So you've been you've been in the business for a really long time. You've been doing a lot of work. You're still doing a lot of really work. I'm looking forward to listening to your new album. Um, what would you how what sparked your interest in music? What are your early music memories? You know, uh, uh, <laughs> I always said I was born with it, and I t because uh, in uh, on New, Year New Year's Eve, nineteen fifty, um, my parents, uh, my my dad married his. He was in the hospital. He was shot down in World War II, and he was in a hospital in uh, North Carolina. And my mother was his nurse. Met her in the hospital, right? And they uh, and he brought her back to Texas to to a little town outside of Comanche called Sydney, Texas. It's where Seals and Croft are from. Same little town Seals and Croft are from. And, and uh, uh, I, I grew up with those front porch jam sessions, acoustic yeah. guitars on the front porch. The, the Seals and family and the Cross family were neighbors and to, uh, to my, my, my dad's family farm out in Sydney. But uh, on New Year's Eve, 1950, my, my my parents and four other couples jumped in my dad's old uh, jalopy car and drove to Brownwood for a New Year's Eve concert with uh, that was Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. And then over, yeah, over a two week period in October, all four couples had babies. <laughs> they were all inspired. So I'm always saying I was born to boogie. And, uh, but, uh, I started, my dad bought me a, 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 get, a guitar at a real young age, about 10 or 11 years old. And then I, I really, really, I mean, I learned songs. I would, I would play songs to him. He bought one of the, <clears throat> one of the first stereo, uh, stereos I've ever, I ever saw. I mean, he was really, he was a wildcatter by business. My dad was. And, um, and then, uh, in a particularly flush period, when I was about uh, 14, he bought, he bought four, 15, he bought me a, a Gibson J200 Everly Brothers guitar. Guitar players that listen to this will go, he did what? I mean, uh, uh, being 15 years old and having uh, one of the finest Gibson guitars ever built, my dad bought it home, a J200. Gibson Everly Brothers model. I had two big pick guards on it. And I started, boy, my music instantly got real good. I started going, green, green, it's green, they say. And, you know, and they, and they started asking me to, to, you know, play for all of their friends. And then I started playing at parties. And then we, I had a kind of a, uh, 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 my dad and mother were allowed a, neighbor's friend to stay, a daughter, uh, they moved out of town and she was going to TCU and she, they gave her a, a place to stay to finish her semester at TCU and she was a beatnik. <laughs> and there used to be over on university uh, at the, where the bridge goes over the Trinity River to university, there was a roller skating rink and then down the hill under the roller skating rink there was a pizza parlor, and that pizza parlor was where all the beatniks hung out. And she, Darlene, used to babysit me, and and she would take me down there and let me roller skate. And we would have to, and she had a little uh, Triumph, and my guitar would barely fit in that back seat of that Triumph. And we'd drive down there, and she'd take my guitar down to the pizza parlor. And I would roller skate for a while, and then I'd come down the stairs, and they were playing bongos and doing poetry, and they all would ask me to sing. And so I did, and that was probably my first audience, and it never went away. And of course, then I was always, always inter interested in theater. Unfortunately, I actually thought about musical theater. That would have been a disaster. 
<laughs> I mean, you maybe know. not a dancer. Show you know, to guy, uh, but maybe not a dancer. I could I could kind of move like Walter Matthau as a young <laughs> man. So uh, uh, you know, but uh, you know, I was I was game. I was getting ready to try it. I actually did. I actually studied it and and actually all the way into college, <laughs> studied yeah. musical theater too. <laughs> Yeah, so you're not from Fort Worth, but you live no. here now. You've born done a lot of work here. I'm born and raised. I've spent oh. spent ninety percent of my life in Fort Worth. No, I take that back. Probably sixty percent of my life. I always <laughs> I've lived in San Francisco. I've lived in New Mexico, and and Wimberley and Austin, but it's always been for you know one year periods, two year periods, and then I come back to Fort Worth. If you'll probably edit this out. But I, I've been gone away. I'm in, in Europe and come back to Fort Worth. You know, lived in Taos, come back to Fort Worth. Wimberley on the Blanco, come back to Fort Worth. So I always have said that the thing about Fort Worth that's so effective is that Fort Worth sucks you in. <laughs> <laughs> and it does. Uh, you always come home. You always come home. There are those of the there are those of us who have left, like T Bone Burnett, and and uh, you know there's a bunch of people that that take off for great for greener pastures, and don't come back. But a lot of people come home to Fort Worth, and I always have. Fort Worth is such a unique music community, and I know we were talking a little yeah. earlier. And I, it's something that I've just been discovering since I've been here about eight years, and it's something that I'm still kind of discovering all the new things that we have and all the musical transitions, but who, who are some of your, how, why do you love the Fort Worth, I guess, music community and the Fort Worth scene and how does it influence you and how do you feel? It's, it it's kind of deep history, a long solid history that, uh, that it, it has affected music all, worldwide. The Texas tenors, the alto players that came out of here. Uh, uh, Ornette told me some incredible stories about how that happened. Uh, Dewey, Re uh, out of the same class, of uh, high school classes, uh, came Ornette Coleman, Dewey Redmond, and, and King Curtis. Uh, you go back further, you, uh, you've got the creation, the origin of, of, uh, of Western swing with uh, 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 Milton Brown and the Dot Crust Doughboys, and then of course, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. You've got people that, that, that uh, have, have claimed this town as home. We got Willie Nelson was, was about to set, was given up and about to settle back home here in Fort Worth when, when uh, Eddie Wilson came up from Austin and found him and drug him back down to play at the Armadillo World Headquarters in 19, <laughs> In the 1970s, you know, he would, he, he would have still been sitting here living over where he, he'd have probably been living in Fairmount, you know, uh, if, if, if Eddie hadn't come back and picked him out. But uh, uh, it goes on and on and on and on. The, 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 the jig joint music, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Jacksboro Highway, uh, everybody stopped on the Jacksboro Highway. Uh, all the way, the whole thing, the whole strip from downtown all the way to the lake was nothing but clubs and live music venues. Uh, the Rocket Ballroom is the one that's that you can look at right now. But the casino, I was actually, as a kid, I was actually taken to us, the, the Dorsey Orchestra at the casino. I mean, I've, it, Fort Worth has given me a, a Conway Twitty at the Rocket Ballroom. I remember it from my six or eight years old because they couldn't find a babysitter and they went to, we're going to see Conway Twitty. Uh, and you know, it, and it, and it said that. And then the, then there was the remarkable, I have a project that I'm working on right now. It's about to go into production. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a new record label for record town records. Our legacy record story in town is the Bruton family used to have it over on, on, uh, about across the street from TCU on University until they recently lost their lease and and Bill Mackey and Tom Reynolds uh, were generous enough to take the whole thing and almost as a museum and relocate it over on the south side and and uh, I'm creating a record label to try to 
uh, create collector item records issued by Record Town. And the, f the first one is, is to honor the, uh, the, the new Bluebird nightclub over on Horn Street, which for, a genera for my generation of, of young white guys in Texas, that was a pivotal cultural moment. I mean, not just in music, but in our culture in Fort Worth. Uh, I've had, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of, Joe Nick Potosky is thinking about writing a book about this because it's really an interesting thing. That was a location, there, uh, there were, uh, there were uh, factions of the, of the community in Como that did not like the fact that Robert Ely was creating an atmosphere at the Bluebird that was inviting to the white community. But it happened. And for the first time in our lives, and one of the first times, you know, outside of Chicago or uh, some places in, in Harlem, uh, it was probably one of the first times that something like this happened where the music was so good that it drew the whole community white and black and, <clears throat> and created a cultural uh, scene that uh, doesn't really exist right now. I'm, and we're talking about in, in, our, in our society at the moment, but uh, we were together dancing drinking beer from ice down beer from a trough, a, a, a cattle trough, galvanized metal cattle trough full of ice behind a, a bar that was set up on, 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 uh, on saw horses and people dancing on old coat crates because they were too short. Uh, the night that the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus uh, showed up uh, after their show, still in their clown makeup and stuff it was the most amazing there you know it was an amazing cultural just, experience and it i'm sorry i was to say i just want somebody to paint a portrait of that, oh, that just, well that's one of the, that's one of my, this is one of my projects that i'm trying to do there was a uh, in in 1973 uh stephen bruton and t bum burnett got together with a studio in arlington the blue royal studio they had some remote recording equipment and they got them to bring that over to the Bluebird and they recorded a, an evening of uh, Robert E. Lee and the Five Careless Lovers when Stephen, Stephen Bruton's big brother Sumter, his band with Jackie Newhouse, who played with Steve Ray Vaughan and, and uh, Liz Austin. Now, Mike Buck, who was in the Fabulous Thunderbirds, was playing drums uh, and, and Leroy Brothers. And uh, 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 Ralph Owens was playing keyboards, passed away, rest in peace, Ralph. And uh, it, it was an incredible evening. And, and as Lady O uh, uh, we, we was bartender there for a long time, I asked her one night, we were talking about Robert over at the Keys Lounge, and she said, she said, that Robert, uh, he couldn't sing, but he sure could perform. And that's exactly what, he, what it was. It was a, it, they captured this the way that it sounded the, the 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 audience singing along with them on turn on your love light and uh and and Sumter had the tapes he had the he had the 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 quarter inch safety masters that the vinyl was pressed from in 74 there was only 500 albums pressed and it's a legendary a lot of you probably if you've gone to a record collector store you've probably seen this cover of this record, uh, it's a it's it's a collector's record, uh, and uh, 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 he had the tapes, and so I I said, well, uh, well, I talked to Bill Mackey. I said, well, this should be the first record on Record Town Records, and so I took it up to to Denton to a friend, uh, uh, Justin Lemons, who is uh, the audio cure one of the audio curators at the Sound Lab at the at the University of North Texas. And he and David Hoff assisted me in baking those old tapes, those old analog tapes in their computerized oven. And then immediately within 30 minutes, we played them back and recovered as much of the data as could possibly be recovered in the digital age off of those tapes, ran them the, uh, the uh, time. And then 
and I, I didn't even have to. I I, uh, I sent the tapes to 1979 studios in Nashville for some mastering, and all we did is we re removed a little tape noise. That's all we did. We didn't change the, which was Stevens, and uh, and and T Bone's uh, mastering from 1973, and we were, and we print we made the the stamps from that. And uh, 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 and then we've taken the original cover, and we've uh, uh, changed it to reflect the. Uh, we've used the you know, original credits and new credits, and we're we've we've created a uh, a poster in the style of the day. You know, they used to have slogans on them. You know, uh, uh, shake in action here in town, those kind of things, and then a picture, and then letters at an angle and printed almost like circus posters, right? Yeah. And so we've, we created one of those for this album that says Robert Ely and his careless lovers, five careless lovers, live at the Bluebird every weekend. And uh, and then the slogan we, we chose was, get loaded and be somebody. <laughs> uh, and it says that's flashed across the top, right? And then on the back, there's information about Robert and pictures and then record town and pictures and then yeah, that's folded and inserted into the out uh, the with it's got a black polyline dust cover and a 180 grain collectors 180 grain translucent royal blue vinyl record with the brand new numero uno record town records center imprint and that's going to press uh, in about two weeks. I want to say um, it's amazing the technology that we have now and yeah. you're working with libraries and I'm assuming you're working with archivists and people like you have been in the industry for a really long time just being able to preserve all these amazing things and yeah. do all these projects for people like me now or collectors or just the casual listener to have that opportunity to be a part of that music history, I think it's wonderful. And I think it's great that you're able to do all this work in the DFW area and not necessarily just Fort Worth, even though Fort Worth is amazing, but with people all around yeah. who really are just trying to do something cool and are just a really good culturally relevant project. So kudos to you on that, that's amazing. And it's a, it's, it, it's a joy to me. I wish I would, had been able to release my album and go to South by Southwest and do my showcase in April. And I, at first I was so sad, you know, just I, I felt like, oh my God, I had this opportunity as an old man to go play rock and roll again. And it's gone, oh, woe is me. But then it's such a joy to then turn and reflect and be able to, to uh, do what I'm doing right now. It really feels good. And I'm able to help young friends. I'm able to, I, I'm, I'm doing what I call facilitation. I'm not doing, I'm facilitating music projects and uh, on new music and, and preservation of old music. I was gonna say, my next question for you is um, about Amplify 817, since you are one of our curators. Um, how do you think Amplify 817 is going to help the current musicians, the ones that we're finishing up we are finishing up on the project right now so how do you think it'll help them and the music scene that we have right now uh, uh, I think it's in, I think that you guys started doing this uh, prior to the crisis that we're in and the idea was was formed there it was a really good idea then giving a platform like this to local musicians and making it uh, making it so it's accessible to them and and uh, and they see that they see it coming back at them is a really strong community uh, uh, improvement in our in in Fort Worth. Uh, I, I try to make that as as uh, as formulized as possible because now we're in this crisis and this thing has happened and everything changed everything changed almost overnight for performing musicians and and there were and there are a lot of people in our community who were making their living by performing uh, music at least a, a, a 
major portion of their income came from uh, performance. And when it, when it was gone, when, when, those, when those roads were gone, there was a hole, a void that just did not seem to be able to be filled. And we keep finding bricks and stones to put back into the law. And, and this is really, really a wonderful thing that, uh, I, that I believe in the, from the bottom of my heart not, not only uh, gives exposure to uh, uh, artists and, and not requiring their immediate, their, their whatever their next release is, but giving them a vision from what they are and who they are and where they've come from. That's a good aspect of it. And being able to give them something for their participation is almost uh, a, a, a godsend at this point. It's just wonderful for these. Uh, and, and, you know, it, we only wish there was one of these every week. <laughs> and amplify, amplify 817 every week. And our community is large and their talent is deep. And, and, uh, and you, you at the library and have recognized the fact that, they, that it exists. The local community is real and you focused on it and focused on the people. The, our, our group of curators brought together different aspects of our community. How many times in our conversations did we ask, do you know this person or do you know that person? And everybody, well, no. And one person would go, yeah. And we go, well, you got to know this person and all that. It, 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 we have a vital and, and growing commu arts community in general, but music community specifically. And you guys are contributing uh, um, wonderfully. To the to the community and uh, and I thank you from my heart for your uh, uh, for your insight and foresight. And we thank you very much for being one of our curators. You were a great help during this whole process. As I say that, as we're wrapping everything up, but um, thank you so much. You've just brought a lot of insight to us, and we were just really excited because you are obviously a very large part of the Fort Worth music community and other music communities and. I love your stories, so I'm really glad that we had you aboard. Um, but as we wrap up our Q&A, is there any advice that you have for any aspiring musicians or music fans out there? This is a time that, 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 that is, that creation comes, creation is a unique thing to me, and it's something that I've tried to study throughout my life. And these creative bubbles that happen are rare and far between, and this is one of those rare moments Take this opportunity to create, write a song. I don't care if you can't sing. I mean, write it. It's the famous Kurt Vonnegut advice, you know, make art, just do it. It'll, it'll cure your soul from, from your heart. And those of you that have those deep talents, you do it in times like this. And it's, it's art that you're going to remember for the rest of your life. A lot of my friends are vividly doing it right now. And that's what I urge everybody to do is create, move forward. That's wonderful advice. Thank you so much for, for our interview today. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we sign off? Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you everybody at the library. It was fun. Yes. Look forward to the next round. Yes. Stay tuned for that next submission round. Thank you so much. Have a